Good morning. Thanks for tuning in to Horizon Community Church for our Horizon at Home service. We're so glad that you've joined us from your living room, your family room, wherever you're at. We're glad that you're watching us today. We really hope that this service is able to still bless you and speak to your life. We're going to start our service with worship right now. So wherever you're at, go ahead and sing loud and join us in worship. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. The sounding joy, joy, unspeakable joy, the overflowing well, no tongue can tell, joy, unspeakable joy, it rises in my soul. Never lets me go. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love joy unspeakable joy in overflowing well no time can tell joy unspeakable joy
Rock you, babe, on bended knee Save your manatee Unto us a child is born He shall reign No well, no well. Come and see what God has done. No well, no well. Story of amazing love, light of the world, given for. Son of man, there before the world began, born to suffer, born to save, born to raise us from the grave, Christ the everlasting. shall reign forevermore. No well, no well, come and see what God has done. No well, no well, story of amazing love. Light of the world Given for us No well We have a couple quick announcements for you this morning uh, we want to let you know about. Right now is a really important time to stay connected. And we want to stay connected with you as a church. And so one of the best ways we can do this is through our Horizon app. And this is available for the Android or iPhone. All you have to do on your phone is, is go to where you download apps and type in Horizon Community Church and it should pop right up there. And we'd love to just stay connected with you that way. So be sure to check that out. Also, we have several different options for giving your offering and tithe. Uh, there's a great little link set up through the website at horizonweb.org. Just click on give and you can give your offering there or you can give through the Horizon app or we even have a text to give option. And this is really simple. You just take your phone and you type the word give as a text message and send it to this number, 209-618-2777. And it'll walk you through the whole process. Really easy to do that way. Uh, let's see, we also have, um, since, since we're not meeting live this week, 
We talked with the donut shop. We didn't want to leave them hanging. And so we set up a relationship with them that if you need your sugar fix, you can just go over to the donut shop, tell them you're with Horizon, and then you could have a donut on us. And so we would love for you guys to enjoy those. So make sure you stop by the donut shop, grab those donuts, um, and get your sugar fix on. Our Night to Shine event this year is going to be completely virtual. It's going to be a virtual night to shine. This is a first for them and a first for us, but we're excited about it. And we are now taking signups for volunteers and honored guests. And you can check that out through the link on our website or directly at nighttoshinenorcal.com. And volunteer positions are filling fast, so if you'd like to do that, go ahead and get registered right away. Now, as far as live services go, uh, we are on a week-to-week -week basis for making that decision. Uh, but we want to stay connected and communicating with you about that decision. And so we want to make sure that you're on our email list or our text message list. And if you're not and you want to be added, you can simply send an email to staff at horizonweb.org and just write, add me to the list. And they will get you right on there. And that way you can stay up to date as far as what's going on with live services each week. Lastly, we want to let you know that we still need you to be praying for Johnny Talent. Johnny Talent's one of the members of our church, and he is currently in the ICU of Lodi Memorial with, with COVID and other COVID-related issues. Uh, but Johnny has had a lot of us praying for him, and there were some good signs this week. Uh, they were able to bring his oxygen levels down a little bit, and he was a little bit more responsive. Uh, but he's definitely not out of the woods yet. And so we're just asking you as the church to really be praying for Johnny and his wife, Randy, as they just go through this, this difficult, difficult season together. So please, please be praying for them. And finally, we are going to light the Advent candle. You know, they asked me to light the Advent candle of joy today. And uh, my first thoughts was, how on earth am I supposed to light the candle of joy with a straight face? Uh, because this 2020 year has been one heck of a year for everybody. You know, I even read an article this week in Christianity Today entitled, How to Do Advent When Nothing Seems Worth Celebrating. <laughs> and it was a good reminder for me, as, you, as I read the article, that the actual year of Christ's birth wasn't just stars and rainbows or mangers and laughter. Uh, contrary to the har Hallmark myth, the first Christmas was not a season of, of good vibes and tasty treats, although I am down for both. <laughs> From the very beginning, the context of Christmas was one of injustice and one of death. And to understand this, we need to only remind ourselves of the circumstances that actually surrounded the birth of Christ. There was this tyrant puppet king, Herod, who was out to kill him. They were trapped in a place that they did not want to be, surrounded by the cruelty of others, of the common man, so much so that it forced a pregnant woman to give birth, surrounded by animals in a stable. And spiritually, they weren't much better. God's people were dead. No prophet or angel had spoken for centuries, and there was a deep longing for connection, connection with God, connection to, of what it means to be the people of God. But it was in the midst of that mess that Christ was born. And with the birth of that child, the world changed. God's silence ended. Angels began to appear, and they brought promises that the God King had come. The long and lonely exile had ended. And so, when I reflect upon these things, I can light this candle today, this candle for joy. And we pray the prayer of God's people from long ago, that Christ might give us joy, 
joy no matter what our circumstances, joy that cannot be explained, joy that can only come from God himself. May he fill your house, your heart, and your family with joy because he is our true source of joy. May he give us hope where there is no hope. May he bring peace to our brokenness. May he heal those who are sick and remind us all of what really matters. Amen. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Well, good morning, Horizon. I'm glad you could join us out there in the internet world, wherever you may be finding yourself today, whether you're sitting at home, whether you're in your car or walking down the street. I hope you're enjoying uh, the Christmas season. We only got two more weeks until Christmas is here. So I hope you're taking the time to enjoy family and friends and not, re not to forget what this season is all about in this crazy, crazy, crazy time that we're living in. Well, Today, we're going to continue our series in the book of Revelation now, which is kind of strange being that it's Christmas time. Shouldn't we be telling Christmas stories? Well, the book of Revelation chapter 12 is a Christmas story. It's the Christmas story, probably how you've never heard it before. So if you have your Bibles, your smartphones, uh, open up uh, to the book of Revelation and we will be in chapter 12. So let me kind of review again to kind of set the stage where we have been thus far. We've talked about that the purpose of the, the book of Revelation is not just to inform us, it's to change us. That based on what we learn about who Jesus is, about our relationship with him, about how things are going to transpire at the end of age, uh, we should live differently. We should plan differently. We should be acting differently based on that truth. We talked about the book of Revelation as the only book that gives us a promise, uh, a blessing, um, that if we read it and if we take it to heart, then our lives will be better for it. We said that it's going to challenge our view of who Jesus Christ is. The question we asked, do, do I know and adore the awesome, glorious, powerful Jesus portrayed in the Bible? Or have I adopted a culturally appropriate, mild-mannered, user-friendly Jesus of our own imagination? In week two, we again challenged our view of Jesus. Chapter one, week one was a, a Jesus with flaming eyes and flaming pillars, legs of bronze. Uh, the next week was talking about Jesus as the Lion of Judah, Jesus as the King of David, but more importantly, Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Week three, we were asking the questions of, will you be radiant and ready or raptured and removed? Based on the answer to that, and we'll ask that again during our time here today, based on where you believe your position will be, come at this point in time, are you going to have a front row seat? Or as a believer, will you have to walk you through this tribulation time? Then you will prepare differently. Week four, we showed that God was exercising restraint, allowing room for repentance and salvation. Uh, but what you've seen is that this window is narrowing even more as, as not only were the seals, not only the trumpets, and we will be getting into the bowls soon. Last week, we talked about no matter what the world looks like today, and no matter how crazy and just out of control things are tomorrow, God wins. And that's the good news, that throughout all of this, God wins the day. And today, it's really of a shorter main point. It's simply this. Satan's hatred is relentless.
Did you hear that now? I don't want you to forget that. We're going to be saying a lot. Satan's hatred is relentless. Now, Satan wants nothing more than to sabotage us, to disrupt us, to tempt us, to get us to live a lifestyle that is away from what Jesus would want. He stands ready to accuse us, and he's already, always planning the next attack. You may have been successful in holding back and, and, and really fighting off the temptation, but I guarantee you he's got others lined up. And I know that some are watching this. Some of you don't even believe in the devil. Some of you believe Satan is basically comes out at Halloween dressed in a red suit with a pitchfork. And others of you kind of like disregard him as a pest or a pesky mosquito that flies around every now and then. I think both options are wrong and can be disastrous. Because here's the truth. If God allowed Satan to have his way, if God wasn't restraining back, gave him the full right marching orders to attack us spiritually and physically, he would, spend, he would waste no time in taking us out. The only thing preventing that is God himself, which we'll see in a little bit. And Satan is real. Satan is one who masquerades. That's what 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says. He masquerades as an angel of light. He always carries a little bit of truth to hook us and then reels, reels us in. Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about the restraining power that is holding back the present evil. In verse 6 it says, And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. There's this presence, there's this power that is holding back the full force of the devil. And someday, which we'll see in Revelation 12, that holding back force is going to be removed. Now understand, Satan is neither all-powerful or completely powerless. He has power. He's not all-powerful. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know what you're thinking. Because if he could put thoughts, I've said this many times, if the devil could put thoughts in your head, would he ever stop? No. If he had the power to do that, it, Satan is limited to doing, doing the things that he does. But someday, that restraining force will be released. So in Revelation 12, we truly do find the Christmas story like you have never heard it before. In verse 1, it says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. We have a whole new scene here in Revelation 12. We're going to be introduced to characters in this chapter. Some are past and some are yet to come. If you remember that mountain illustration we talked about last week, the two mountain peaks, where you're seeing one here, they look close together until you get them side by side, and there's a great deal of time. Within these several verses, thousands of years transpire but we're kind of getting a big picture idea of not only what has happened, but what is promised to happen as well. And the character here is a woman who is pregnant. Uh, it says here that she was, it was a special, special sign. She had the sun, the moon, the stars were all wrapped around here. Now, the pregnancy, the birth that is about to happen, the guys, this is the Messiah. Now, the pregnant woman is not Mary. That's not how this part of the story goes. Yes, the real story is Mary gave birth to Jesus. But this, again, we're getting different pictures of different things, things that mean something now and things that mean something later. And so understand the world at the time when Jesus was born was anticipating. There, all the signs were in the sky, the magi, everything was happening for this event to take place. You had Mary and Joseph, you had Simeon, and yet you had Anna. All these people who are anticipating the world was set, the stage was set for the coming Messiah. But it also gives us an Old Testament picture when it says the pregnant woman. 
wrapped into the stars. And and within within your notes, there's a lot of further study. I encourage you to do that because this is where a lot of Old Testament Hebrew scriptures come in that if you didn't weren't raised that way, and remember, if you're Jewish reading this and you were raised in the Jewish tradition, then all these things would have kicked you back, back, back to the Old Testament about different sayings. And throughout the Old Testament, Israel is depicted as a symbolic mother, if you will. That's, that's in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, and Isaiah. And even the symbol of the sun, moon, and stars is directly out from a dream that Joseph had when he was, he had this member of the dreams of Joseph and he's telling his dad and his brothers, hey, I saw the sun and I saw the moon and I saw the stars bowing down to me. All of a sudden, he's talking about, hey, you guys are going to bow down to me, but this is Israel. This is a reference to Israel. And so we have to understand that the woman throughout Revelation chapter 12 is standing for the nation of Israel. And this woman will give birth. She's ready to give birth here. And again, all in the Old Testament, the references are in your notes that talk about Israel being pregnant, so we have a woman, we have a woman who's pregnant, about ready to give birth, and then we're introduced to another character in verse 3. Then another sign appeared in the heavens, an enormous red dragon with 11 heads and seven horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Now, this is something right out of Greek mythology. You would think a seven-headed monster with 10 horns and seven crowns. And again, Old Testament-wise, you go to Daniel, you'll see this exact reference as well. Uh, the nations, usually, when again, when it talks about nations and horns, horns depict, depict power. The nations, seven nations. I mean, and you go down the list, there's Egypt, Syria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, R Rome. All those have been, and there are future ones that are talk about this power. That's what we'll find out later in Revelation when it talks about this ten-nation confederacy. But here is this dragon with seven heads, ten horns, crowns, and it is there ready all right. And so the dragon, which you're not going to see that in any manger scene, I'm, I'm sure, you know, having a little red, seven headed red dragon at the, at the end of Jesus getting born. But that's the depiction that is going on right here. And it says that his tail swept a third of the flung out the third of the stars. And that's referring to the demonic forces. Several times throughout scripture, again, you can look those places up where it talks about a third of heaven fell when Satan fell. And so you've got a third of the amount of angels. Now, we don't know how many angels God started with. We know there are myriads of myriads and thousands upon thousands. We know in a few chapters ago, we talked about the 200 million demons that were going to be released. Released, So you can get a picture of the amount of demons that were brought out here. And this dragon's intent, the Christmas story, is verse 4. The dragon had stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might, that's right, devour her child the moment it was born. You know, hark the herald angels sing, a big dragon's going to eat the baby king. We don't hear that hymn. I mean, that's, that's right out of the scripture. That's exactly what the devil was going to want to do. He wanted to consume. He wanted to destroy the evil one. So understand, guys, when we talk about the Christmas story, we did, you know, again, we, we don't put in a typical manger theme the, the, the flies and the smells and everything that was there as well. But understand the demonic forces of, of the world were pointed to destroy the child. Satan's hate is relentless. I mean, the birth of Jesus was supposed to. I mean, Herod tried to kill the baby. So there's Satan at his job. All throughout Jesus' ministry, they were trying to take care of him. So understand, this is the intent. This is what the devil decided to do. You want a good read? Max Lucado, the book called The Cosmic Christmas. And it's all about the kind of this passage where the demons are fighting. And you see that the sword's drawn. And that's why the inn was filled when they got there. Not because people were there, but the angels protecting the child to, to fill it up. So they had to go out to the manger because the devil would never think that king of kings and lord of lords would be born in a manger. And this cosmic Christmas, this cosmic battle that was taking place, Satan's hatred is relentless. 
Revelations 12, 5 says, And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And so in one verse, you go from birth to ascension. All right, you covered 33 years right there from Jesus' birth to his ascension. So the child was born. This is talking about the Messiah. It's talking about the male child who will rule the nations. That is Jesus. That's what, again, Old Testament references talk, to, talk about. The birth of the son and he ascended to heaven. And so within one verse, you have 33 years but between that verse and verse six, you have thousands of years. You know, you know, you're watching a movie and how it puts on the screen thousands of years later or 10 years later. That's what this one would say. Thousands of years later, verse six. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of 1260 days. There's that day thing. That's that three and a half years. Again, 42 weeks, however different ways they've said it throughout Scripture. There's a time frame. And remember that the woman here is Israel. It's talking now thousands of years later, Israel will flee to a place, a place prepared for them in the desert. Because why? Israel's being chased by the devil because Satan's hatred is relentless. He doesn't give up. He missed out on the child, but he's not going to miss out on the child's people, that being the nation of Israel. And so it says here that they fled to a wilderness. We'll talk about that in a second. Because this Israel, remember, we've talked about Israel. We talked about the 144,000 people that were chosen and marked and sealed from the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel is playing a, still a key role in God's time clock, guys. It's, it's there. And so this is referencing the nation of Israel. And now it begins to talk about the two great conflicts that were taking place, one in the air and one on the ground. Verse 7 says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. And so now we have introduced Michael. Michael's throughout the scriptures. You see him in Daniel. He's always defending the righteous. Um, and Michael and Satan know each other very well. I mean, they were created at the same time. They were one of the most powerful angels at the same time. And they're fighting all at the same time. This is not the only battle that was has ever taken place between the angels. There has been a war, and this war is now in heaven around it that we can't even see. And Michael defeats the devil, throws him down, along with the third of the angels. Now, there's several things. The Bible talks to us about, you know, Satan and his evil and angels, what they become and how their, their effect on us. And that's why we're told throughout the scripture, check your notes for verses, we're supposed to be beware of him, understand him, his, the schemes that he has, resist him, and he will flee. I mean, those are the things that we are called to do. But Satan has now been thrown down. He's given earth to do his way. Ephesians 6 talks about the powers and principalities that are around us, that this, there's this battle still raging as we speak. Now, we're never told how they fight. Again, you want another good read? Read This Present, this present Darkness by Frank Peretti. That'll give you a little vision of his view of how angels are fighting, man. You got lights and sulfur smells and all that kind of thing that's going on behind the with the, with the angels. It's a great read. I, you know, don't read it to your kids before bed or they'll have nightmares, I guarantee you. So this great angel battle takes place and the devil is thrown out of heaven, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. This is what the devil's doing, accusing us all the time, has been hurled down. And now it's talking about the reference of those who are believers in Christ, that they, they overcame. Now, this they, I believe, includes us and includes the future believers in Christ and the past believers in Christ, that they, this is a reference point. How do you overcome the devil? You overcome them by the blood of Jesus Christ because, one, there is no salvation but by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have to be under the blood. You have to have his forgiveness. But then it's not only what Christ has done for us. It's based on their testimony. 
It's not that I've just been saved and I'm just waiting for heaven. It's based on my salvation. My salvation is testified by what I say, what I do, how I live. And it says that they did not love their life so much as to shrink from it. Remember Jesus' words when he talked about this life. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, he said in John 12, 25, the man who loves his life will lose it while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Again, depending on your view, what, what position you're going to have here, I promise you, I, I know this around the world, there are Christians that are standing up right now who are losing their lives based on their testimony, based on that they're not willing to shrink back from that. And someday, you and I might have to face that same reality. Now, the defeat of Satan triggers a great outburst of praise. Verse 12, therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury. He knows his time is short. This word wrath literally means outburst, rage, anger, fury. Satan was thrown down to earth, but now everyone here has to deal with him, not only just in the air, but now on the earth. And he's mad because why? He knows his time is short. Just as we can set our time clock about how long there is, the devil can set his time clock as well. He knows his time is short. And you think, well, then why doesn't he stop? Why doesn't he confess? Why does? Because that's what power of pride does. And he's going to fight no matter what, because Satan's hatred is relentless. It will not stop at all. Verse 13 says, When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to earth, he pursued the woman who gave birth to the male child. So the pursuit hasn't happened. He's relentless, guys. He will not give up. And as he as basically the hunt is on. And again, Satan has tried to destroy Israel from the very beginning. I mean, not only do you follow that in the Old Testament, you go for the New Testament. I mean, the Middle Ages were horrible for, for, for those who were Jews, the Nazis and the concentration camps. And then when the nation became, uh, when Israel became a nation in 1948, that's not stopped. You've got Persian Gulf countries that are saying, we're going to drive you back into the ocean, into the Med. I mean, they want to destroy the nation of Israel. I mean, Satan's hatred is relentless upon them. It will not stop. And this is where I love it. Verse 14, then the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and a half time out of the serpent's reach. There, there again, there's that three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 weeks, again, just said in a different way. And even this two wings of a great eagle, this is what it was talked about, how Israel was brought out of Egypt in the, in the book of Exodus. With the wings, the wings symbolize strength and speed and protection. And that's what is given. God makes a promise that he's going to protect Israel. Romans 11, 28, 29, this is what Paul says. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. That's the Jews. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. I like that word. Irrevocable. God's gifts, God's call, God's promises are irrevocable. He made a promise to Israel. That's why we have the Hebrew scriptures. That promise is going to be fulfilled in the book of Revelation. The devil is going to pursue Israel. God is going to protect her. That's why, the, again, the two wings, he says at the end of verse 14, he'll be taking care of her a time and a time and a half. A place prepared in the desert for her. Some believe that this is Petra, the fortified city that's cut out of the rocks. Some believe this is the hills kind of close to the med. We, we don't know because Jesus said, flee to the mountains. So wherever this place is that he's prepared, he's telling the Jews during this tribulation time, when, the, when, when, when Satan sets up his image in the temple, all this that we, we will continue to talk about, 
Flee to the mountains when you see them. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, that he has prepared a place that is out of the reach of the devil. They will be supernaturally taken care of. They'll be supernaturally fed, just like they were taken care of in the desert with the manna they will be taken care of here. Satan may know where the Jews are hiding, but he does not have the power. He will not be able to defeat them because of divine protection. But he's relentless. He's not going to stop. Second attack, verse 15. Then from the mouth of the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and swept her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Satan's hatred is relentless. It's not going to stop. When you see a flood throughout Scripture, and again, back to the Old Testament, when a, a bunch of nations are come together to attack, they're, talk, they're distinguished as a, as a flood, and Jeremiah and Daniel talk about it this way. But again, they are taken care of. Again, all of a sudden, it says the earth opened up and defeated these nations, swallowed up the water. Images of Moses, when all of a sudden the earth opened up and swallowed up all the people who were being disobedient to God. But he didn't stop there. Attack number three, verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged. He thought he was ticked off before. At the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Those who obey God's commands and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Yes, that's us. God continues to protect the Jews. And now he's so angry, he just turns his wrath upon the whole world. And so those who are not Jewish, who are believers in Jesus, because it says as those who obey the commands and hold to the testimony. It's not enough that you just know about the Bible or know some stuff from the Bible. It's about those who obey God's commands from the Bible and hold to their testimony of who Jesus is. They're holding to the truth about Jesus Christ, how important it is to know no, no, the word of God. Satan's hatred is relentless. He's never going to stop. He's never going to stop pursuing us. He, he, he has no problem not pursuing people who say they're Christians and aren't following. It's those who obey the word of God, who are in the word of God, who are given testimony of, of who he is, who's willing to make a stance. He won't stop. He never will until we're in heaven someday. And when he's taken care of, that's another chapter. God's gifts, God's call, God's promises are irrevocable. He said it, which means he will fulfill it. That's his promises are true. And some of you need just to hear that today. The promise of what he secures, the promise of salvation, the promise of forgiveness of sins, the promise to bring us home someday no matter how crazy it is around here. And again, will we be radiant and ready or are we going to be raptured and removed because depending on your answers, depending on how you will prepare yourself. This is the true picture of Christmas. There's been a battle. I mean, from the day the birth was announced to the day he was brought into this world, the evil one has tried to do everything in his power to destroy, to devour the child. But God protected. And he protected him for 33 years. And he protected him going to the cross, even though Satan thought he had won by killing the Messiah, only for Jesus to raise two days, three days later from the grave. The resurrection. Christmas is Easter. And Easter brings us victory which again, in the end, God wins. Let's celebrate this Christmas. Let's celebrate the truth of what God has promised, that his promises, his call, his gifts are irrevocable. Guys, God bless you. Have a fantastic day. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in this morning. We're so glad that you joined us for another online service. Our prayer here is that these services will just continue to bless you and your family and that you will be able to really experience that Christmas joy this year. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you guys next week.